Deuteronomy, uh, chapter 6, read in its entirety in, in the original Hebrew. So that took a lot of guts. Thanks so much, Emily. Yeah. I know that took a lot. Yeah. <laughs> Praise God for that. Yes. And there is a reason why um, I wanted it read in. Uh, guys, I'm going to have to move on your stuff, do you mind? Or is there another one I can use? No? Um, yeah, uh, there is a reason why um, I wanted Evelyn to read it in the original Hebrew, because that's what I want to kind of bring out this morning, if that's okay with you. Thanks, Gary. We're between lecterns at the moment. Um, <laughs> yeah. So uh, that's why we're, um, we're having to improvise a little bit, but hopefully by this time next week, perhaps, we'll have a brand new lectern. It'll be a little bit higher than the usual one. Old stupid to read. Um, but hey, let's be glad of any kind of lecture at all. So I'm just going to pray and then I'll just read a little bit from God's Word and try and find out what, trying to uncover and unearth and unpack what the Holy Spirit would uh, have us here this morning. Philip, are you able just to take me up a little bit if that's possible? Um, so there we are, let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for that word. We thank you for Deuteronomy, a beautiful word, Lord, a lovely word. Lord Jesus, a book about love. Father God, you are the you are the God of love. And today, Lord, we just commit ourselves. As you give your heart to us, we give your, our hearts to you. Please, Lord, bless this word, Lord. Take away any lumps of fat or gristle, Lord, and let only the truth of your word remain with us. Come amongst us by your spirit and anoint this word, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, rather expertly, with the glory of God, Evelyn read from the original Hebrew. She read the entire chapter of Deuteronomy. I'm just going to read up to verse at 9, and after that I'm going to go even short. I'm going to do like an exegesis and get closer and closer to the Word. So let's read it in our Bibles, Deuteronomy 6, verses 1 through to 9. These are your commandments, decrees, and laws the Lord your God directed me to teach you to observe in the land that you are crossing the Jordan to possess, so that you, your children, and their children after them may fear the Lord your God as long as you live by keeping all the decrees and commands that I give you, and so that you may live and enjoy a long life. Hear, O Israel, and be careful to obey, so that it may go well with you, and that you may increase greatly in the land, flowing with milk and honey, just as the Lord, the God of your fathers, promised you. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your strength. These commandments that I give you today are to be upon your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. Thank you, Lord, for, your, for that word this morning. Well, the, De the book of Deuteronomy is the last book of the Torah, the first five books of the Bible. A little quiz, what are the other four books of the Torah? Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus. Very, very good, yeah. It's Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers and Deuteronomy, known as uh, the Torah or the Pentateuch or the Law of God or the Law of Moses. We've had a few problems with the mics this morning. Can everyone hear me clearly this morning? If you can't, raise your hand. Good, good. I mean, if you couldn't, you wouldn't have been able to hear what I just said. <laughs> okay, so Deuteronomy means second law or the second giving of the law. The second law, Deuteronomy, was written to the second generation of Israelites. You might remember that the first generation had the chance to go into the promised land, promised them by God, but they bottled out. They said, we're not going in there, they're all giants, we must be grasshoppers in their sight. We're not going into the promised land. Joshua, Caleb, Moses, and, and Aaron said, we can do it, we've got God with us. But this, all the people who went to spy out the land of Jericho came back and said, no way are we going in there, we stayed in the desert. God said, you want to stay in the desert? You can stay there for the rest of 
your lives. And a trip that should have taken about 11 days took 40 pretty miserable years. Almost certainly the book of Deuteronomy was written by Moses, but it does pose a question, how could Moses write about his own death? So <laughs> some people say that he might have done that prophetically, which I suppose he could have done, but I don't think so. I think the rest of the book of Moses was written by Joshua. That's the general consensus. Deuteronomy features three farewell speeches from Moses spoken over a period of about 30 days. And Deuteronomy is quoted and cited many times in the New Testament, more in fact than any other book of the Torah, more than any book from the law of Moses. And you might know that Jesus himself quoted from Deuteronomy on many occasions, most notably when he was in the wilderness and the devil was trying to tempt him. You know, the three rebuttals he gave, the three replies he gave to the devil's lies were all, were all cited and taken from the book of Deuteronomy. So it's a pretty special book. So with uh, Evelyn going from that size of Deuteronomy 6, and me going to that size, I'm not going to focus in just to two chapters, uh, sorry, two verses in Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy 6, 4 to 5, you know these verses. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. Amen? Amen. Well, what, this is one of the most important passages in scripture. For the Jews, this was probably the most important part, certainly of the Torah, probably of the Old Testament, maybe even of the entire Bible. Now everyone these days has a, a mission statement or a faith statement, and uh, this is the faith statement uh, of the Jew at the time. We have mission statements, which you can read at the back if you ever want to read what our mission statement is. Everyone has a mission statement, every organization, company has a mission statement. Last year, everyone was the 2020 vision. Yeah. Everyone had the 2020 vision last year. So this is the faith statement of uh, the Jews and a faith statement that we can incorporate as well. A value statement, a mission statement. Everyone's got one. It's an affirmation to the call of total commitment to God. Are you up for that? Yes. yes. Amen. And in a polytheistic world where everyone around at the time was cherry picking uh, their own um, gods, you know, I have a little bit of this and have a little bit of that. And many gods, a pantheon of gods, they all lived in the mountains, apparently. <laughs> they did. Um, this was big news. This was a proclamation that there was one God in Israel and there's one God for us, Father, Spirit, and Holy Ghost. Amen? Amen. Amen. So let's read it again. Deuteronomy 6, verses 4 to 5. We've gone. And we're in Deuteronomy 6, 4 to 5. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. Darling, can you move, uh, can you bring my drink up? Gary, I was obviously I was talking to my wife. <laughs> Thanks anyway. Thank you, Dad. Sorry, I forgot one word there. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. Water break. This is known to uh, James as the Shema or the Shema. And that comes from the first word, um, which is hear where we can get the word here from, the Shema, hear, O Israel. Hear can also translate as listen, pay attention to, focus on, respond to what you hear, or listen and obey. Jews then, and probably now, would say the Shema on any, or the Shema, on any occasion, at any time. It's a devotion that is spoken orally, it's uh, said up, it's set to music, sometimes actual music, sometimes a cappella. It's not unreasonable to deduce that at any time during any day, 24-7, the Shema is being spoken by a Jew somewhere, some, somewhere in, in, uh, in this world. <laughs> Jewish children at a young age were encouraged to learn the Shema almost as they, the first words, you know, like we hope they'll say mummy and daddy. <laughs> your Jewish person would probably hope they say the Shema. And also, if you're on your deathbed in Jewish culture, you'd be encouraged to recite the Shema. I don't know how I'd feel about that, to be honest, you know, I'm trying to 
fade into death and somebody say, say the Shema, say the Shema. <laughs> but the dying people were encouraged to say it as well. Uh, and Jesus himself quoted from the Shema uh, as the first and greatest commandment in the Lord. Uh, he quoted from the Shema. Change it a little bit, but that's okay. He's allowed to, he's Jesus. Uh, and you read that in Matthew uh, 22, verse 37. So it was a very important part of Scripture. So let's look at each one, each uh, three parts of what the Word of God is asking us to do. Love the Lord your God with all your heart. Love the Lord your God with all your heart. Does anyone remember love hearts? Yeah. Yes. Yes. They're great. They're still around now, but obviously when you were a kid, the tomb was this big. <laughs> now it's like that small. I mean, love hearts when I was a kid, you used to have to like back them into your house, you know, to meet you. Now it's like tiny and you slip into your pocket and everything. There's even a fragrance now, a shower gel called love hearts, okay? You can get it all. Uh, but when I was a kid, we used to pass around the love hearts and you'd give it to somebody you really liked. Rona remembers. She's had a love heart in her time. You've probably passed a few on as well. And it always said something really flaccid like, um, I love you. <laughs> Will you marry me? Will you be mine? Be mine forever. If you get a packet of love hearts and you open them, they're the kind of things that it says. I don't know why I used to love, you know, the really dark, <coughs> beautiful ones used to have a really sharp taste, I used to love them. And so if you were really shy as a kid, you'd pass out the love hearts and get a message through the love hearts. <laughs> Well, it seems to be, we always think in some way that the heart is a bit floppy, a bit fragile, a bit damp. And that's the way we look at it. We look at it as we look at the love hearts, you know. I love you. Will you be mine? And that's the way we see it. You see it as like the love is a bit uncontrollable, a bit soft and a bit damp. We almost live like we are not in control of our hearts. Because we say, oh, my heart's been broken, my heart's been this or, or that. But really, that's not the meaning in this particular scripture. Love the Lord your God with all your heart. It's not necessarily what we would think of heart as that sort of uncontrollable, fluffy, pink, heart-shaped unit. In Jewish thought, the heart does not mean the seat of your emotions, as it does in English, but the centre of your intellect and intentions. The centre of your intellect and intentions. Total intent. When somebody says, I put my heart into it, total intent. When somebody says, I did it with my whole heart, total intent. When you hear an athlete saying, oh, I give my heart to that cause, you, you think total intent. And that's what the Word of God says. That's what it would have been in Jewish thought. And we see examples of that in Scripture, guys, don't we? When Moses was trying to bring the Israelites out of Egypt, Pharaoh's heart was hardened. In other words, his will was hardened. The writer of Ecclesiastes says he gave his heart or his full being to study in wisdom. Nehemiah said God put into his heart, into his will and intentions to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem after the exile. God spoke to Zechariah about people who would not listen to the truth because their hearts, the centre of their will and intentions were as hard as flint. Flint being the hardest material that was around at that time. And when Peter told the people of Israel that the Jesus they had crucified was Lord and Christ, they were cut to the heart. They were cut to their will and intentions because they realised they crucified God's own Son. And you can read that in the book of Acts. So many things battle for our hearts, guys. Relationships, celebrities, fashion, Gadgets, music, computers, the internet, selfies, mobiles, all these things battle for our hearts. But Jesus wants to be the centre of our heart, the centre of our will and intentions. He will not take second place to anything at any time, not even for one second. So we have to put him first in our heart. Our enemy... And we know who he is. We'll put anything in our way to put other things first in our heart. And we can all fall for it, guys. Even the best of us can fall for it. So watch it. 
make certain we put him as the first place in our heart, the first place of our will and intentions. We can't put God in second place because he just won't take that. He just won't take it. Won't take Luke warm. Does not like Luke warm. What did Jesus say to the church in Laodicea? I know your deeds. You are neither hot nor cold. I wish you were either one or the other. So because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I am about to spit you out of my mouth. Revelation 3. Then is big words. God would prefer us to be cold rather than be lukewarm. In other words, just to turn up in church, looking at our watch, thinking, oh gosh, what time is this going on? I've ticked the box, I've been to church, I'm going home now, I've got, want to watch something or I want to do something. You know, God wants to be first in our heart. Mm. Lukewarm, no thank you. He'd prefer us to be cold. When I was saved in the first church, I, I went to the youth. I was about 28, I don't know what I was doing in the youth. But I, I, always, I always looked quite young. So they said, oh, we'll, have you in the, we'll have you in the youth. There was one guy in that youth that was so full of the Holy Spirit. His name was Daniel. A great biblical name, yeah? And whenever we, we, we was dancing, he would be praying, he'd be dancing for the Lord when we were doing worship. He always wanted to talk and read the Bible, he'd be praying for people. He absolutely loved the Lord. And then at one stage of his life, he got into a relationship with somebody from outside the church who wasn't a Christian. And let's just say the lifestyle that they were living was not glorifying for God. So he had that problem. He was attracted to this woman. He wanted to make it work with this woman. She wanted nothing to do with Christianity. He also wanted to follow God. So he was in that lukewarm situation. And Daniel was afraid to come into church. By the way, whatever you're going through, come to church, okay? If you really, really, really want to come to church, come to church. If you wake up in the morning and think, oh, I'm not fussed about church, come to church. If the last <laughs> thing you want to do is come to church, come to church. Okay? Because whatever the case, you know, we're all in the same boat, guys. Yeah. Yeah. Even him. Okay? We all come in here sometimes carrying a bit of something. So never make that mistake of not coming into fellowship. And never make the mistake of not asking someone to pray for you. Never make that mistake. Some of the guys were brave enough this morning to stick their hands up and be prayed for. Well done, you. So anyway, Daniel wouldn't come to church. And what happened is at the end of the service, all the youth used to go off to McDonald's and have a bit of time together on a Sunday evening after the service. And the McDonald's was not far from the church. So Daniel would wait outside and he'd meet with the, the youth and then we'd all go for um, a McDonald's. And he used to do this. He did this for about three months. And one day he was standing outside the church waiting for us. And I was talking to him and I said, look, Daniel, you've got one foot in the church. He literally did. He had one foot in the church and one foot outside the church. And I think it made him think about things. I, did, I didn't say it. I wasn't being ironic. I said, look, you've got one foot in the church and one foot outside. That's lukewarm people. That's lukewarm people. You know, God still loves us. I don't know what happened to Daniel. I didn't see him for many, many years. I hope he got that relationship with God back. I hope you got that power of the spirit back. Because, guys, it's better, much better than anything the world can give us. Don't listen yes. to the lies of the devil. Amen? Amen. Amen. But lukewarm people, they have one foot in church and one foot outside church. And God will not put up with it. Okay? God will not put up with it. William Cooper, in his beautiful hymn, Oh, for a Closer Walk with God, says, The dearest idol I have known, whatever that idol be, Help me to tear it from thy throne and worship only thee. The dearest idol I've known, whatever that idol be, help me to tear it from thy throne and worship only thee. Putting God at the centre of our heart and our will and intentions is a choice we have to make, guys. We have to make that choice. We can't expect God to do it for us because that's illogical so if you're sitting in church or you're sitting at home and you're waiting for God to come to you and saying oh I'm just waiting for God to come to you he might come to you but I don't think he will I think it'll be like the prodigal son happy to meet you halfway but if we're just sit, sitting waiting Luke will wait for God to come to us thank you very much with our dog and our pipe and our slippers <laughs> and I don't know what the men will be doing <laughs> 
If we, if, we, if we do that and we're just waiting for God to come to us, we'll, be, we'll have a long wait. We'll have a long wait. So make it part of your intention from this time on just to cross that line in the sand. You've been lived for too, too long. Step over into the will of Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. Amen. Put your heart into it, your will, your intentions. It goes on. Love, love the Lord your God with all your soul. With all your soul. The English meaning of soul, what we all, um, we all, when we think of soul, what do we think? We think of a sort of spiritual or immaterial part of a person. When we feel we are moving between the secular and the spiritual, we call it the soul moment, yeah? We're all in soul now. That's what it means in English. I'm speaking to my soul in it. We talk about dark nights of the soul, the soul experience, and we listen to soul music. Because that's what we think. We think we're touching some kind of spiritual realm, and then we can just nip back into the secular realm after. So, that is not necessarily the meaning of the word here. The word for soul in Hebrew means the living being, or a living physical being. And it's still, it's the, it's the kind of word ascribed to any uh, living person. The same word is used in Psalm 42, 1. As the deer pants for the streams of water, so my soul, my whole being, my physical being, pants for you, O oh God. Amen? That's a good prayer to have today, isn't it? As the deer pants for the streams of water, so my soul, my whole living physical being, pants for you, O oh God. As God gave everything for us, we should give everything for him. If you're coming to this church, and please hear me right on this, and you're not interested in giving everything for God, can I respectfully ask that you find another church to go to? So, I missed out strength. I did, I did what I did last week. I missed something out. What am I doing? I think God's saying, come on, maybe. Um, okay, so love the Lord with all your strength. And I meant what I said just now, so take that on board, okay? Love the Lord with all your strength. Now strength, when we think about strength, we think about physical power, don't we? When I was in school, it was always the strongest guys that, that won any bet, okay? You couldn't win with intellect. I just used, I just used to tell them joke and they wouldn't beat me up, so that's why I got what I am today. Um, and, and in our school, there were some tasty guys there. And that's what we think, we think strength. Physical strength, that's all that mattered. Strength always won it when I was a kid. And when we think about strong people, we think about Bible characters, don't we? We think about Og, the guy who had a bed that was 13 foot long. He's a big guy. I'm assuming he was strong as well. Think about Goliath, the Philistine who came to fight against David. He was a huge bloke. And of course, we think about Samson as really strong people. Though if you look at the if you look at the the story of Samson in the book of Judges, there's actually nothing there that says he was particularly well built. But he only did the will of God and only came in power when the Holy Spirit went on him. Now I think he probably was quite a physical guy, but it doesn't say that anywhere. And in fact, when we meet Samson in heaven, he might be a really puny guy. <laughs> and we would go, I thought you were a big guy. So that's what we think when we think about strength, but that's not necessarily the meaning in the, in the uh, verse today. The Hebrew word here for strength means, in really posh English, all your very muchness, okay? In plain English, it means devoting every capacity you have to God, living excessively for God. The term strength here is really brings together the previous two words, he, um, of heart and soul. In other words, heart, soul, everything, the whole shooting match. In other words, everything we've got, every fibre of our being to follow the Lord. We have been called to live a life totally sold out to God. Like Isaiah, we set our faces as flint and give everything to walk in with our God. Nothing stands in our way. Every day moving forward. Graham Kendrick uh, was one of my favourites. I know he's not everyone's cup of tea, but 
were one of my favourite uh, worship singers because I was saved really with all the big way stuff. He has, has a beautiful song called For This I Have Jesus. And one of the lines in that says, we need a steely-eyed endurance, strength to fight and win. I'll say that again. We need a steely-eyed endurance, the strength to fight and win. We have to make that choice, guys. It's not going to come to us. We have to make that choice. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, and your strength. In other words, with all your intellect, instructions, emotions, or instructions, intentions, emotions, your whole being, your whole living, physical being, and with all your very muchness. Amen. And this is summarized by David, isn't it? In Psalm 103, verse 1. With my whole life, with my whole heart, with my whole life, and with my innermost being, I bow in wonder and love before you, you holy God. I'll say that again, Psalm 103, verse 1. With my whole heart, with my whole life, and with my inmost being, I bow in wonder and love before you, the holy God. Amen. You want the Lord to move in in your life? Love the Lord with all your heart, soul, and strength. You want the Lord to move in this town? Love the Lord with all your heart, soul, and strength. You want the Lord to move in your family? Love the Lord with all your heart, soul, and strength. You want the Lord to move in your workplace? Love the Lord with all your heart, soul, and strength. You want the Lord to move in your ministry? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and strength. You want the Lord to move in this church? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and strength. And then maybe we can say what Paul said as, as practically his last words. I have fought the good fight. <coughs> I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Love the Lord with all your heart, soul, and strength. Guys, isn't he worth it? Yes. Yeah. Yeah.